Well, good morning, and once again, welcome to our YouTube service from Nutley Way Parish Church here in Belfast. I'm Ray Harness, I'm the People's Warden here at Nutley and I'm once again, I deputise you for Irvine, our Delson reader, who's on holiday. First of all, there's a, a, an announcement that has to be made regarding the General Investor meeting, which will take place on Tuesday, the 6th of October, at 7.30 over in the Church Hall. Only registered members of the General Vestry are entitled to vote. This is a perennial year, and it's particularly important this meeting, the Select Vestry will elect parochial nominators who will be involved in the appointment of a new minister for our church. Representatives of the Austin Senate will also be elected at this meeting, so it is important. Further to that, and completely separate from that, there is a select festival meeting this coming Tuesday, the 29th at 7.30, over in the Aslan Centre. Our first reading today is from Exodus 17, verses 1 to 7. Water from the rock. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, travelling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rapidim, and there there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarrelled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to test? But the people were thirsty for water there. They grumbled against Moses. They said, why do you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, Why am I to do what am I to do to these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered, Moses, go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take it in your hand the staff which you stuck in the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So, so Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel and he called the place Massa and Merib because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Our second reading is from Matthew 21. The authority of the Jesus' question. Jesus entered the temples and courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders, the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? they asked. And who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you what the authority I am doing this things. John's baptism, where did I come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves. If we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people. And for all the whole of John, John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. The parable of the two sons. What do you think? There was a human who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said, the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Here ends the readings. No, no apologies to the report. <laughs> Which of the two did his father want? The first they answered. Jesus said to them, Truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness. And you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw these, 
you did not repent and believe him. Here ends the reading. Good morning to you who are joining us online either today or at another time. Let's just pray. Father, will you come now? Will you speak unto our hearts? Lord, open your word to us that we may understand what you're saying to us and that we may obey. In Jesus' name. Amen. Your know, context is so important. Everything we read in the newspapers or hear in the news or even in a conversation comes from a context. A statement or remark can be taken or taken out of context can be made to mean anything at all you like. And to understand the parable that we just read this morning, we need to get the context right. Jesus had come into the temple and he overturned all the tables within the temple. He chased out the money lenders and, and wrecked the whole place in that sense. The hierarchy, they were up in arms at Jesus. They had already decided before this that they were going to kill him, that he was just a nuisance to them and they were going to kill him. And now in verses 23 and 27, the chief priests and all their elders come to Jesus. They're trying to trap him, to get him to say the wrong thing. By what authority are you doing these things? They ask. They had it worked out in their own heads that Jesus is only one of two answers. First of all, he could tell them that he's acting in his own authority. Or he could tell them he was acting in God's authority. If he said he was acting in God's authority, he was acting on God's behalf. The people would consider that blasphemy and they would turn against them. Alternatively, Jesus might say, well, I'm acting on my own authority. And then the Pharisees could pull him up because he had no formal training. And Jesus knew what they were trying to do. And he turned the tables right on them. He responded, I'll answer your question if you answer mine. What baptism and ministry did where did John's baptism and ministry come from? It's basically the question. Was it from men or was it from God? The leaders were sniggered. They couldn't say that John's authority was of his own, it was from them, because the people they considered a prophet and they wanted the favour of the people. So they didn't want to go against the people. The people would actually turn against them if they said it was uh, his own. On the other hand, if they said that John's baptism was from God, Jesus could say to them, well then, why did you not believe him? Why did you not uh, take part? So they refused to answer. And that's when Jesus tells this parable. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in my vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will go, sir. But he didn't go. Which of the two did what the father wanted? The first, they answered. Joe, it was pretty obvious that the first son, the one who initially refused, represented the tax collectors and the, the prostitutes and the other unreligious people 
that were around in those days. The second son represented the religious leaders. And that parable presents us with a couple of, of principles for our lives. The first principle is simply this, actions are important. Actions are important. When Jesus asked the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, which brother was obedient, they couldn't refuse the answer. The answer was painfully obvious. It was the one who did the father, what the father asked. And the implication here is clear. Jesus feels that the religious leaders, they're all talk, but no action. I'll do it. But then they don't. And Joe, you know, I believe that this parable is very relevant to us living in a very dark world today. A world in which there are many people who talk about having faith, but actually, at the same time, they don't acknowledge God in their lives. Their actions don't live up to what their mouth says. There are people who say, yes, I believe in, in God. And yet they ignore God's commands about morality, about, about gossip, about personal holiness, about anger, about forgiveness. All of those things. Back in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And those verses, we use them all the time. Because they remind us that God is the one who is responsible for our salvation. We can't do anything to earn what is a gift. So obeying the law can't save us. But let's keep reading to what that says, the context in which Paul is saying it. He says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. In other words, we're not saved by doing good works, but when we're saved, we do them. See, God saved us for a purpose. He's going to change us and he's going to use us. And the true believer is one who just professes faith, but the one who lives by faith that's the whole argument that James had in his letter. In James chapter 2, verses 14 to 19, we read, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims he has a faith, but of no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about the physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. The whole point James is making is that it's pretty simple. Anyone, even demons, can say they believe. Even demons can articulate good authority, probably better than most of us. But the man, the woman of faith, is the one who allows their faith to alter the way they live. Faith, profession, without action, is dead. It's like a son saying to the father, and go then ignore them. Well, I don't know about you, but so far I felt pretty good about my own Christian profession whenever I was reading that. Then God began to ask the, those sort of awkward questions. How often have I sung in the church hymns like, Take my life and let it be? And then not follow through. And just think of the implications of that him. How often have I promised to pray for something or someone 
I looked on it for a few days and then forget about it. How often have I been through a tough time or a tough situation and told the Lord that I would follow through and I would, I would be even more devoted to him if he got me out of that situation and then whenever everything become all okay again, forgot about it. Do you know, that's the sort of stuff that the religious authorities of Jesus' day were doing. <clears throat> they meant well. They thought they were being really godly. But their faith was superficial, really. It was all about talking. Being seen to be doing the right things. But in no real depth. You know, our hearts are so important. They really matter in this. Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Do you know that simple statement contains both good news and bad news? There's bad news for the people who are thinking they're going to get to heaven because of their good reputation or maybe even the good things that they've done or their good church attendance, being brought up in a Christian family or their ethnic background. That's where the hope of these teachers and Pharisees lay. They were good Jews. They tried to live by the law. But Jesus told them that even the tax collectors and prostitutes were entering heaven before them. They were passing them by on the way to heaven. You see, the words of Jesus are very bad news for those who think they can get to heaven by their, their deeds. But it's very good news for those who recognize themselves to be sinners. They fall short. This is good news to those who feel that, you know, I'm not good enough. Because Jesus is. You know, people who have been involved in the legal activities or people who have messed up their life in any way at all or caught up in drugs and drink or alcohol. Those who they just don't know anything about the gospel or wouldn't even know what the inside of a church looks like. Those are the very people who were responding to the message of grace during the ministry of John the Baptist and Jesus. The people were flopping into the kingdom were the people who the religious folks just didn't want to know. They shunned them. See, here's the thing. God isn't looking for religious activity. He's looking for men and women, boys and girls, who will open their heart to God and receive forgiveness for life. He's looking for the person who will believe that God can and will change anyone who's willing to receive Jesus Christ as Saviour. Anyone at all. And there's a message here for Christians. You know, no one is beyond salvation. No one. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they thought the people like the tax collectors and the prostitutes and so on, well, they're too far gone. God wouldn't want them. They're too bad. Tell me. What is it holds us back from sharing our faith in Jesus Christ with certain people? Is it because we're afraid of them? Is it because we don't like them? Is it because we don't care whether or not they find faith in Christ? Or is it because we don't actually think that they'd be interested? Let's be honest, 
Sometimes we act more like the Pharisees and we care to admit. And if we're going to be affected and reach in others, we need to remember that we're sinners, every one of us. That's where we are. You know, some of us might have been notorious sinners, but we were sinners nonetheless. We fall short of God's standard. The truth is, every single one of us was heading to hell until someone shared the gospel with us and we believed. So there's a good chance that some people will find it hard to believe that we're here today. But God's full of surprises. And times whenever we're one of the surprises for others. See, God has always his way of, of choosing the most unlikely people. Just think about the whole scriptures the way through, and indeed the whole of Christian life so far. Jacob, he was a deceiver. Hagar, she was a prostitute. David committed adultery, and then he murdered to cover up. Matthew, he was a tax collector. Paul persecuted the church, and he was party to murder as well. John Newton, he was a, a slave trader before he wrote that lovely song, Amazing Grace. And you know, the list could go on and on and on infinitum. And you know, some of the people God used were were once living far, far away from him. See, God is full of surprises. A couple of years ago, I was conducting a service down in, uh, down the country. And at the end of it, one of the prisoners came up to me and said, you're the last person I ever thought I would see in a pulpit preaching the message. Do you know what? I looked at him and I thought, you're the last person I thought I would ever see in the church. I'd worked with him 40 years ago, over 40 years ago, whenever we were both far from God, no interest in God at all. But amazing grace, God had brought them both of us to himself. Totally different because we hadn't seen each other for nearly 40 years. God, in his grace, had the two of us there. See, the truth is, God changes lives. Yes, he hates the sin that's in our lives, but he loves the sinner. And his great mercy will receive anyone who will turn to him. See, not one of us deserves his mercy his mercy at all, none of us. But we received God's gift of grace. He made us new people, new creation. He changed us. He gave us his spirit and he began the rebuilding process in our lives. And his old hymn says, what he's done for us, he can do for others. He can change the lives of other people. What God did in your life, he can also do with anybody else, anyone at all. And the message for us should be very obvious. We're to offer the gospel of Jesus Christ and the message of Jesus to anyone who will listen. I'm not talking about going out to Bible bash anybody. I'm talking about sharing our faith in simple ways. And sometimes the person we think is way beyond is a person who's closest to the door and just waiting for someone to share. There are two very practical issues raised in this parable. The first is the issue of our salvation. Simply this, who or what are we trusting for heaven? Your profession. People you know, not knowing the gospel or living a good life, or are we basing our confidence in heaven? 
an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you trusting that he died in your place? Are you willing to trust him enough to make him Lord of your life? Will you enter into a relationship with the Saviour? If you're willing to enter into that relationship with Christ, then you can be saved. Whether you're in this church this morning, listening online, even today or any other day. See, it doesn't matter what your past is like. It's past. It doesn't matter what kinds of sins that you've committed. If you're willing to trust Jesus Christ wholeheartedly, then it will make you into a new creation and you'll be brought into the kingdom of God. So if you've never made that commitment, I encourage you to do so today. In a simple act of faith, put your life into his hands. The words you say, they're not important. That's not the important thing. It's the attitude of our hearts. Simply just where you are, tell Jesus that you're sorry for all the things in your life that don't honor him. Ask him to forgive you. And to send the Holy Spirit into your life to help you live for him from this time on. The second application is for those of us who have trusted the Saviour. You see, <clears throat> this parable raises an important issue of integrity. Does your life square with profession? Does my life square with my profession of faith? I don't mean our church life, I mean our whole lives. Are we professing Christ publicly, but ignoring him the rest of the week? See, this parable is actually a warning to the church. We're reminded that our testimony means very little unless it's verified by our lives. See, the true believer isn't the one who has the right answers. The true believer is the one who trusts Christ. How can we tell if we've repented and trusted Jesus? Well, simply this, our lives will begin to change. We'll begin to do what the Master tells us. We'll try our best to be honest in everything we do. We'll do our best to encourage others and, and not to pull them down. We'll try to serve rather than demand. We will get our direction from the Bible, not from public opinion. In short, simple, we practice our Christianity. But let me be careful to clarify what I'm actually saying. Two things, very simple. First, we don't act in order to gain salvation. We're obedient because we've received God's gift of salvation. Our salvation can't be bought, can't be earned, it's a gift. And secondly, we remember that growth takes time. We're not going to, to see all the vices of our lives change immediately. It's going to be a lifetime of struggle. One day at a time. We'll have to remind ourselves to follow the Lord every day. Every moment of every day. Because it's so easy to slip back into the old way of lives, especially at the start. But over the course of time, we will, we should, we must be making progress towards the goal. Because whenever we get to the end of our lives, God isn't going to just listen to what we say. But he's going to listen to the context in which we say it. Let's take a moment just to pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your amazing grace. 
Thank you, Lord, that your grace saved a wretch like me and many others here today and others listening online. Lord, would you help us to live out our profession? To be the people of Jesus Christ in our generation. In Jesus' name.